Good morning. Um, it's of course Tuesday morning once again, so glad to see you guys. Uh, we'll be uh, doing our study on the church at Thyatira this morning. And uh, so you guys will be looking at the book of Revelation chapter 2 beginning in verse number 18 this morning. So if you want to go ahead and get your Bibles set up for that. In just a minute, we'll start doing our prayer request. So, if you miss Liz, says no sound. No sound. Can you hear anything? I didn't think about sound. I don't think that has a trigger for sound. You're up. Oh, okay. Miss Liz, it must be on your end. Uh, we are broadcasting sound, so you might want to check yours. Hey, Stuart. Miss Josie's got sound. Okay, good deal. So she confirms it. Hey, guys. Good to see everybody. All right. Uh, so, guys, if you all want to get started, is there any prayer request out there that you'd like to send in? Go ahead and uh, uh, type that in for me. Miss Alicia confirmed she also can hear, so uh, we're good. So Miss Liz, uh, maybe your sound volume, or you may have to, like I think I know what I'm doing, click it off and back on. TJ says, please pray for Amanda. Off and on. She is uh, really having a tough time. We really will, brother. So, Amanda. What happened with that? Are you that? using the doc from pulpit that I gave you? Or did you go back to your doc? I did not. Let me do that. Thank you, Brother Wade. Uh, so turn that off. Are you are you editing the pulpit doc or are you just watching? Just watching. Okay. Right, as soon as I can get in, brother, I'll help you with the progress. Brother Wade is running on uh, Wade Cox time, so uh, he'll be here when he gets here. The YouTube stream is up and running. I can't get the apps to launch, so I can't use that, brother. I oh, have really? to go back to my own standby. That's fine. The yeah. thing that works. That way I don't have to worry about it. Running. All right, I'm in. Okay, let me see if I can get what's going on. Uh, who else with the prayer request? Stuart. All right. Um, hey, Miss Ramona, good to see you. Uh, hey, Miss Janet, good to see you in here. Robbie, Miss Ethel, you guys are just loading up. Very good. Any other prayer requests, just make sure you go ahead and get it typed in there in the comments, and we'll get it on. We've already got uh, Brother TJ's daughter, Miss Amanda, who is doing some struggling, and, of course, Brother Stewart with his back issues. Uh, be praying for our guys that are going to be working this week. We, they're supposed to pour concrete uh, just after lunch today, so we got that. Uh, um, <laughs> TJ says Liz needs to turn up her sound on her hidden icon list. <laughs> Good job, TJ. Boy, she'll come over there and put knots on your head faster than you can rub them. <laughs> oh, but uh, hey, Brother Keith. Miss Robin, um, we, so we got concrete coming uh, after lunch this morning, and um, so you'll be praying for those guys. Still have one more box uh, in the parking lot we have to um, fix after that, but that may be something that has to wait till later, okay? And uh, Brother David Capstraw says to continue to pray for his, uh, his friend's six-month-old son, Brandon, so, um, and... Have you got any update on that, Brother David? Is uh, the baby doing better, or do you know? And Miss Janet says good morning, and Miss Carol, good morning. All right. Just about two or three more minutes, and we'll do our prayer. I want you guys to remember Sister Billy in your prayers. She is uh, doing better, I think. We 
We stopped one of her medications uh, about a week ago, I guess. And um, I think she's doing better. She seems to be doing okay. So y'all remember her in prayer. Uh, Ms. Robbins says, uh, my friend Kim, she has pancreatic cancer and is not saved. Oh my. She watched a preaching service on Sunday. That's fantastic. And then she says she lives in Seattle. Awesome. So remember Kim in prayer um, for salvation and for her cancer. Mike said, I need to do some sweating. Maybe I'll come by and watch you guys work. <laughs> yeah, don't get too close to it, Mike. <laughs> Oh, mercy. You'll have to watch them work. I don't do much work. I, I'm still um, I'm playing the handicap role, you know. Uh, Miss Josie said I want to pray for Sister Ann. Sister Ann is uh, having a little bit of a tough day today. This is the anniversary of her mom's passing, so y'all remember her in prayer. She was talking to me a little last night about it. It's uh, really uh, touching her deeply. Um... Ramona asked for prayer for her and Mike, um, and he's got dialysis today, so Mike and Ramona. And Brother Wade says we're on YouTube also, so don't forget that, guys. Hey, Bobby, good to see you, buddy. Did you see that Castro? Uh, about the baby, six months old. Oh, Dave. No, I don't think I did. Oh, there he is. He's doing better. Yeah, David, thank you for that. I got Brother Charlie in here and Brother Wade. They're helping me keep up with this stuff. Uh, said his blood counts are out of whack, but they had to send him to a different hospital to see why. Okay, very good. Hey, that might be a very good thing because I know you said it was uh, started out with a respiratory issue. So if it's um, yeah, it, prayerfully, it's maybe anemia or something like that that they can fix relatively easy. So that's good news. All right, guys. Um, we've been in it about uh, almost 10 minutes, I guess, so far. About eight minutes so far. So, um, Miss Mary, how are you? Good deal. All right. Um, ready to start. Miss Sandy, good to see you. And uh, you guys that um, maybe are just getting in, I want to remind you we're in Revelation chapter 2 and I believe it's verse number 18 that I said. Is that correct? Yeah. That starts the uh, letter to the church at Thyatira. So I um, invite you guys to get your Bibles open and ready for that. Um, Revelation chapter 2 verse 18. So uh, I think I mentioned to you about the guys working on I don't think I tapped that into my notes, but uh, I'm going to put the work crew they have been diligently keeping things going. Miss Liz found her speaker. At a girl. <laughs> and Sandy say, pray for Robbie. He's sick. Huh. Sorry to hear that. Let him know that I love him, okay? All right. Very good. All right, guys. Let's go to Lord in prayer, and we'll get started. Fathers, we bow before you today. I want to say a thank you for your awesome power and presence in our life. There's just nothing like you, no one like you in all this universe. And we're grateful for all that you do. And Lord, as uh, we're reaching out this morning to continue our Bible study, Lord, I'm, uh, I'm beginning to where I get, get excited about being able to log on and, and connect with so many different people. When we, we have our Tuesday morning Bible study uh, in person, where sometimes we can only have eight or 12 people in the room, but Lord, uh, like this, we, we're doing better than 20, 25 sometimes, and that's just incredible to me, and I, I'm so thankful for that. So I ask God that you'd help us to uh, get better at doing this and to be able to take the Word of God into our homes on a regular basis and to teach uh, the doctrine of the truth of, of God's Word and the Bible uh, in, uh, in regular um, intervals and consistently so that we can uh, minister to those that you've given us, Lord. So uh, we have some prayer requests, God, we just want to bring to you. And the first one is uh, Miss Amanda. This is Brother TJ's daughter. She's struggling. Pray God she'd be with her. And for Brother Stewart 
uh, the pain in his back and those types of things. Lord, we ask God that you would uh, help him to be able to find some place of comfort and, and get the relief from the struggle that he has with that. We pray for that, uh, that baby that uh, Brother David has told us about out in uh, New Orleans. Uh, we pray, God, you'd, you'd just be with Brandon. Lord, help that child, six-month-old baby, and now they're thinking that there's some blood disorder maybe. So I pray, God, that you'd just help there. Thank you for uh, touching my mom. Ask God that you would continue um, to bless mom and uh, help her to get stronger uh, every day. I uh, pray, Lord, that you would um, continue to answer her prayers as, Lord, she is uh, just one incredible lady. We thank you for her testimony and for her Christian walk. Lord, for Sister Robin's friend, Kim. Lord, I, I, out in um, uh, Seattle, I believe she said, uh, Lord, I, I think of Kim and I think of um, having to face the mortality uh, of uh, the fact that she has cancer, Lord, and, and the pancreatic cancer is usually very, very serious. Lord, I ask God that you would touch her heart. I pray, God, that she would realize how much you love her. And I pray, God, that she would see a, a path and feel a draw to come to know you as personal Savior. We pray for her cancer, Lord, that she'll be able to tolerate treatments if they're given those and they'll be successful. Uh, Lord, most of all, we pray for her salvation. Ask God for my wife, Miss Ann, today. Lord, as my wife... Um, is once again reminded of the passing of her mom whom she loves so very much and she is so much like she learned so many things from her mom and and uh, lord i i want to thank you for that she has been just one incredible lady and i ask god that you would just continue to strengthen my wife and keep your arms around her as this day is um, a, a kind of um, a dark for her as she remembers the loss of her mom but Lord, her mom knows you, knew you as personal Savior, so is with you today up in heaven. And we have the wonderful hope of being reunited once again. So that's the, that's the thing that keeps us going. For Brother Mike and Miss Ramona, Brother Mike's uh, physical recovery as he keeps uh, working, I pray God that you would give him strength and his body and recovery for his health. And Lord, pray God that you keep their spirits up, him and Miss Ramona, as they work together. I pray for our work crew that's here at the church that's been doing incredibly, incredibly well. And Lord, for the, uh, the, the really tough task today of, of getting the concrete put back over uh, most of the holes and smoothing that all out, I ask God you just give them real favor with you. Pray for Brother Robbie who is not feeling well. And um, I saw that Miss Sandy uh, must have uh, mentioned to him already how much um, he's loved by us. And we love him very much, and he sends it back. And Miss Diane uh, says she uh, needs prayer for her arm. Uh, she uh, was hurting. I saw her yesterday, and she was hurting in her arm. I saw when she tried the movement. So she's going to go get it checked out. The pain just hasn't eased up. So I, uh, I pray God you touch Miss Diane. And uh, be with Brother Don, too, as he, uh, he went back to the hospital yesterday to have some tests. So y'all... Please remember, as, um, as we pray for Brother Don, that God would just touch him. I ask now, Lord, that uh, you would be with us through our Bible study, and I pray, God, you give us grace, mercy, and favor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, hello there, Miss Louise and uh, Miss Deidre. Good to see you. Glad to have you on this morning. I'm glad to report that your son is behaving. And I got a big stick in case he don't. So <coughs> your permission, I'm sure, to use it on him mm -hmm. if he doesn't behave, okay? She actually would rather you do. She would rather me to do it. <laughs> Very good. And Brother Frank's in. He may have to go out and in and out. He's probably working. You're probably working right, Brother Frank, and uh, having to slip in when you can. Thank you, Miss Deidre. All right, guys, we're going to be talking about the church at Thyatira. We're looking at, um, hey, Miss Bobby, all the way from Astor, isn't it? Good to see you. We're going to be talking about the church at Thyatira. We're in Revelation chapter 2. 
We're working through the study of the uh, churches. We're actually, we're going to be working through the study of the Revelation. So, um, where Brother Frank says, yeah, he's having to steal the time when he can in between things. So, um, God bless you, brother. You just be careful out there. Thank you. And Miss Louise working from home. That can be tougher sometimes than actually going in, I know. <laughs> So uh, we're going to be, as we're working through the book of the Revelation, there's all types of things that uh, uh, we discover that are so applicable. And before I get into the study this morning, I want to remind you we're in Revelation chapter 2 beginning in verse number 18. Um, I want to tell you and give credit for uh, the notes that I'm using. Uh, Brother Ray Swanson many years ago uh, was uh, our associate pastor here and I I tasked him with the um, responsibility of leading a, um, a study through the book of the Revelation, and he created this wonderful um, notebook of notes, and uh, I, I think it was maybe, it was either Sunday nights or Wednesday nights, um, man, he went for months uh, teaching us out of the book of the Revelation. I mean, was diligent um, every single week to take care of everything, and and done a great job. I still have those notes, and I, I utilize them quite a bit. So I'm uh, very grateful to Brother Ray's work. And um, so some of my stuff that I've got comes from the notes. Of course, some comes from my own personal study, and then I pray it all comes from Revelation by the Holy Spirit. Looking in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 18, now we notice that every single letter written to those churches. And for those of you maybe that haven't been with us the whole time, small recap, y'all hold on, don't go nowhere. Small recap. These seven churches are were literal churches that existed in this time. And uh, these letters were written to the angels or the pastors of those churches to share with those churches. And they were listed in a particular order. We talked about they were listed geographically uh, in a particular order. They're also listed historically in a particular order because uh, they also represent the church uh, from its inception at uh, the day of Pentecost uh, till the day the Lord calls us up in the rapture. And so uh, we're pressing through. I think we're in church number four. I believe this is what this is now. Let me see. One, two, three. Yeah, this will be the fourth church. So we're looking now that uh, we're probably, I think it was the about the 6th century through the, this one covers the ages of maybe 8600 to 8500. They was known as the Dark Ages. And the church uh, at Thyatira was represented of this particular age of the church. But it also meant that the church at that particular time, um, at Thyatira, particularly was having some issues that the Lord wanted to um, did you see brother Keith's note he said YouTube froze up uh, so uh, I'm, so the idea is that um, these letters are written to the church hey Sam for um, the immediate application to those churches but also for the progressive application to the church that we are a part of today. So there's nothing that is more pertinent or current than the letters to the churches out of the book of Revelation. It's more current than today's news, okay? So with that being said, let us look, get into the reading of it here. And uh, first thing that happens is, once again, just like the other letters, Jesus introduces himself and he reminds them that this is his word. And I don't want to keep going over that every single time, but I got to remind you uh, that it's the word of the Lord. And just because the messenger happens to be human, it doesn't minimize the impact of the divinity of the word itself, okay? And so uh, verse number 18 says, And unto the angel of the church in thy tower, write these things, saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and, her, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, 
He already said that once, but he said it again. And then he says, and, to, and the last to be more than the first, or the more recent works to be greater than the first. Verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. It seems that this was the way that Jesus always addressed his church. He first commends them, and then he says, okay, you're doing good in this area, but here's something I need to address with you. And by the way, I want to remind you again, that's true love. That's the reason that, um, that he addresses that way. We need to have that type of accountability with someone will say, you know what, you are, you're doing fantastic in this area and you're really blessing my heart in this particular thing, but there's, there's an area, something we need to talk about. And so Jesus does this with his church because he loves us. And he says, uh, notwithstanding in verse 20, I have a few things against thee, okay? So now that he has complimented them, He's now um, about to tell them what their issues is that they need to work on. The reason this is important is because, my friend, you will not correct anything in your life until you realize that there's an issue with it. When you begin to see there's a problem, that's when you'll address it. And until you do, until you see there's an issue or a problem, until you can become aware of the problem, you won't even try to fix it. You, until you knew you was a sinner, you didn't even begin to think about repentance or salvation. Um, so until you know you're sick, you won't go see a doctor or take the medicine. So J Jesus addresses the idea and says, I have some things against you. And then here we go. You, you hang on. Y'all be with me. Here we go. Now, verse 20. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now here's the problem that Jesus has with the church. Now I need to stop here before I go any further because it's a kind of a lengthy letter compared to some of the others. But uh, I want to talk about a few things before I get into particulars uh, about this woman Jezebel. Um, now that's not her real name, but uh, it represents who she is. Um, I want to talk about if we can back up to verse number 18 for a second and notice that the title that Jesus gives himself here is a little different than the others. He calls himself the Son of God. Now we know he is the Son of God, but here in particular he emphasizes that he's the son of God. And one of the reasons of that is as you see the rest of the description of him that comes out of chapter number one and is repeated here in verse 18 in chapter two is that he is the one that has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass, which simply is indicative of the fact that he's coming to this church with the idea of some kind of justice and judgment and uh, correction, uh, that he has authority. He's not just the friend of the church. He's not just the helper of the church or the lover of the church. He is the God of the church. He's the master of the church. It is his church. And since there's an issue or multiple issues in the church, he is there to address those issues. There's no one that has greater right than the Son of God uh, to bring discipline into the church of God. Y'all still with me? It's the, it's the very purpose of Jesus Christ as the Son of God to bring his judgment, to bring his in, indignation to the church for the failures of the church. Now, you may be thinking, Brother Buddy, you just said in verse 19, he commends them for the things like their works and charity, service and faith and patience, and that their works were even getting better at the end. And, and that is absolutely true. They got some good things. But that doesn't excuse the wrong things. Hmm? Hang with me a second. I want you to understand the same thing is true for you and I. 
just because we're doing some good things, just because we are changing in our lives and God's blessing us and sanctifying us, don't become complacent with the idea that you think that I'm, I've arrived. God has transformed me and there's nothing else that I need to fix and I'm just good like I am. That is a sin. God is constantly, constantly, constantly at work in you and I to transform us. Remember we talked to you about the three phases of salvation. Justification first. Immediately, when you get saved by grace through faith, immediately you're justified. In the eyes of God, there is no sin attached to you because it's been imputed to Jesus Christ and his righteousness is imputed back to you. So immediately you are justified in the sight of God just as if you had never sinned. That's step one. Step two we call sanctification. Step one is justification. Step two is sanctification. And sanctification means being cleansed or set apart. And in the process of sanctification, it simply is talking to us about that this is an ongoing issue in our life from the moment we get born again that God is constantly drawing us closer to be more like him that's the work of the holy ghost to conform us to the image of his only begotten son jesus christ and that's what god is intending to do through the work of the holy spirit in us so he's moving us closer to him this is the work of sanctification and how how often does that happen justification only happens one time that's when you get born again by grace through faith Sanctification is a continual process, constantly, every day, more and more. Brother David just posted it. It's a work in progress, daily transformation to become more like Christ. David, you're spot on right there. And Miss Ramona says, set apart. You guys are right on it. And justification, she reminds us, just as if I'd never sinned. Hey, Miss Ellen, good to see you. Uh, listen to me, though. This is really important. The um, accommodations that Jesus gives, the, the pats on the back that he says, um, I know your works and all the good things you do. And then he turns around and says, here, here's some issues. Why? Because of sanctification. They are his children already. They're justified by grace through faith. And the daily work of separating them to be more like Christ is part of what he's doing when he says, nevertheless, I have some things against you. It doesn't mean that he hates them. It simply means I got some things you need to work on. I got some things I'd like to purge out of your life. And so he has to bring us to awareness of those things. He does that same thing with every one of his children. Every one of us. If God's not working like that in your life, then you need to go back and check step number one. Maybe you haven't been justified. You haven't been brought actually into the family. We preached about that this past Sunday. You might want to go look at that for those that think they're saved, but they're not truly born again. There's a lot of people. Hey, Miss Ellen, it's good to see you too. I thank you. And there's a lot of folks that think they're saved because they made a profession of faith. They prayed a prayer. They maybe even joined the church and got active for a while, but there's never been a true transformation in them. <laughs> Not as I am, but what I will be. And Miss Josie, you're right. It is a blessing to know that we not only can be corrected, but that we will be corrected. It is the love of God that corrects us. The Apostle Paul told us what of which who of us, I think it is the way he says it, um, that um, if we got earthly fathers that won't suffer correction of our earthly fathers, our earthly fathers love us. And they will correct us because of that love. That's their jobs. And if our earthly fathers, who are, of course, not perfect, will do that, don't we know so much more that our Heavenly Father will do the very same thing? So uh, you're exactly right. So um, here Jesus says in verse number 20, he says, uh, you, I'm sorry, let me back up to 18 again. I was talking to him about being, this, talking to you about him being the Son of God 
and he is identifying himself with that, so he's carrying the authority to be able um, to bring this judgment against them. And he comes in, look at him, with the eyes like unto a flame of fire. That's talking about his ability to see everything, the, the inner parts of our hearts and our thoughts. You know, it's, um, it's always been astounding to me that I think um, church people, believers in the church, are still, I think, confused maybe or unaware that God is more concerned about who you are than about what you do or about he's more concerned about what you are than about what you do might be the right way to say it uh, he's he's more concerned about what's in your heart than he is about what's in your hand or what things you may be living out and the reason I say that I, is not because he's not concerned about your actions but he knows that if your heart's right then your walk will be right but there's a lot of people who try to do the walk right and their heart is not right. And there's a lot of folks that think as long as they refrain themselves from physical sin, that it's okay if they entertain the sin in their heart or in their mind. And that's very, very dangerous. And so um, Jesus says, I know I've got these eyes like into a flame of fire. I can see down into the side inside of you in your heart, and um, he's, the, he's the God that knows the very intent of your heart uh, more than you know your own. And so uh, he says also his feet are like fine brass, which I think shows his, um, his steadfastness, his immovability, uh, the idea that he doesn't change. Uh, he's standing for righteousness, and he always stands for righteousness. He comes with the eyes of judgment so that nothing is hid from him. And he stands with the feet of righteousness that never will be moved. And so he has these, this authority behind him. And he says, I know your works and your charity, your service and your faith and your patience and your last works to be better than your first. I know these things. I see everything you're doing. Yet you still have some things that you need to address and what he has against them is so very serious that he brings some threats of accusation, accusations of threats against the church. Now I want to remind you that this was representative of the church during the dark age. And so um, he says, uh, you suffer that woman, that's uh, Jezebel, that calls herself a prophetess to teach. What's the problem with that? Well, you know, Scripture tells us that a woman should not usurp authority in the church. And I know this is going to probably go sideways with some folks, but that's just the way it's going. Um, God's always, always required that he uh, would work through the men if there was a man that would be worked through. Uh, so God has intended that the men should do the leading. Um, if I have to take you back to the Garden of Eden, you gotta remember that one of the penalties of the curse of the fall of man was that the woman would be in subjection unto her husband, right? So, um, the and we know that the church and the relationship of the church with Christ is always mirrored in the relationship of a husband with, with his wife. And so the husband becomes the spiritual leader of the home, or he should be. Now I gotta admit, there's sometimes that he's not. He just, he fails to feel his responsibility. It doesn't mean that God won't lead through the woman, but that's not the way God intended it. That's why the scripture Paul uses says, I suffer not a woman to usurp authority, which means she takes by force. A, a woman needs to stay in her proper place and be in subjection or in their um, willing submission to the leadership of her husband. And you'll find that your home, oh, girls, hold on. You're going to find your home will be a much happier place. You know what the saying is today. Happy wife, happy life. 
you know, that's because everybody's thinking that you got to please the woman. But ladies, listen to me. If you'll get in your place and you will fulfill what God has set up for you and the man will fulfill what God has set up for him, oh my goodness, you're talking about a happy life. The blessing of us doing what God has called us to do I should not try to take the position and the place and the responsibility that God has reserved for my wife. I need to take the responsibility God has given me, which, by the way, is a, a real tough responsibility for us guys. We need to make sure that we put ourselves in the correct place of being submissive unto God and accepting the responsibility and doing what is right. Can I just tell you, my, one of the scripture that transformed my life um, several years ago was Ephesians 5.25 where God showed me, and I saw it over and over again, but finally he opened it up and illuminated it to me where um, Paul says that the husband should love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And I began to think about it. I looked at all the examples through scripture about how Christ loves his church, and how he shows that love through his own sacrifice. I'm not just talking about the sacrifice on the cross. I'm talking about how he loves us and his sacrifice constantly and continually. So with that being said, it changed my whole outlook and demeanor on what my role as a husband should be. Uh, so um, it's transformed my wife and mine, our marriage. So uh, it's pretty important uh, that you guys get this. And um, and I know that we can preach it to the to the husbands that this is your role. Uh, but guys, our ladies, I should say, you guys should also recognize you have a role. Um, it, you need to have that submission um, because it's very very important. Listen. Uh, it's, it's, it's really tough for a guy to try to be a good leader when you got somebody that ain't trying to follow. They, they just ain't going to do it. Uh, so, yeah, guys, you be responsible. I see some great comments coming up here. Uh, you guys got to be responsible to be godly men. Brother TJ threw that in there. That's perfect. Uh, you be a godly man and then she has her responsibility to God to be that godly woman to submit to that. And through that, she's not really, we talk about the submissiveness of the wife to the husband. What you're really doing, ladies, is you're submitting to Jesus by submitting to the authority of your husband. Um, you guys, you, you know the order, right? All authority is giving, given by God. There is no power. There's no authority that is given that is not given by God. That's why he says when we submit ourselves to the rulers or the magistrates in this world, we're actually submitting unto God. So he's the one that's given the authority to our, uh, our governmental leaders. And so we surrender unto them to show that we are truly surrendered unto God. Our children are supposed to surrender to, our, to the parents to show their submissiveness unto God, okay? And wives to the husbands to show their submissiveness to God. And husbands are supposed to be submissive to the leadership of God so that we can, we can all of it is it's a hierarchy. So it's, uh, yes, brother. I got it, I'm sorry. Brother Wade's jumping in. <laughs> I must have touched on something. Well, just actually it goes way back to Sister Josie, and then it links all the way into everything we've gone through here. What Josie said, okay. Um, when you went back earlier and she said something about the uh, security that you had through the submissiveness. Okay. To me, I look back at the, the, the journey that I've gone through here and some of the learning that I've gone through here in, in submission to you as a pastor. And can y'all hear, Brother Wade? If y'all can hear me, somebody put something down. But I'll, I'll talk as loud as I can. So in, in submitting to the authority over you, once you're in that right place, whether that authority is perfect or not. <laughs> okay? Right, right. Because I, I'm saying that from experience. 
once you're submitting, you're following God has what God has put in place for you. God will then hold the authority accountable. As long as you're not out of moral standing with God, and you're doing and still in submission of the authority, in other words, you're not breaking some of, of God's basic moral rules, then the authority is going to be held accountable for being perfect. You're going to be blessed by being in submission. And I say that because whether it's me to the pastor, me to my job, my wife to me, anywhere along the line, each of us have to be submitted and not in judgment of the authority above us. Oh, if they don't do that, then we don't have to do this. And I say that because you get empowered by being submitted. You're not a prisoner by being submitted. You get blessed by being submitted. All right. All right. Now you got me stirred up. And, and they then they can hear you, by the way. They said they could. And Brother, Brother Keith said with leadership comes responsibility also. With responsibility comes accountability. And you're absolutely right. And Brother Wade is bringing up the point that even if the leadership is not perfect, if the leadership has flaws in it, uh, are you still required to submit to it? Well, just let me say this to you. And you're going to catch this because you, you need to really pay attention to this carefully. Here's the issue. If you only submit to the authority whenever you believe the authority is correct, are you really submitting to the authority? In other words, if you ladies will only listen to your husbands and follow their leadership when you agree with them, who's really holding the authority? Aren't you taking what they say or what they do or their example or what their leadership and then you run it through your um, your psyche, your input to try to measure it out to see if you agree that he's smart or he's an idiot and if you agree that he's doing the right thing then you go like, okay, then I'm going to submit. I'm going to submit to my husband. And you're not being submissive to him. You're doing what you want to do because he happened to go the direction that you like. Do you know how many people Christian-wise do the same thing to God? Mm -hmm. When God speaks to us about something and we like it, we go like, oh, I'm going to surrender to God. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. It's a sacrifice, but I'm giving it up for the Lord. In reality, they're not surrendering to God. You're being self-serving. You're doing exactly what you wanted to do and you feel like you got validation because God has asked you to go this direction and you go like, oh goody, that's where I wanted to go anyway. And so now you're going like, I'm, I'm submissive. But every time God asks you to do something or step out in an area that you don't want to do, what about that? Or you go like, well, I wish I knew what God wanted me to do. Priest, pray for me that I can understand what the Lord's will is in my life. You understand what his will is. Your problem is you don't want to do. You don't want to do it. <laughs> we got it going on this morning, don't we? <laughs> uh, Brother Wade started that on being drinking that. I'm going to blame it on him anyway. I'm telling you guys, um, <coughs> Brother Keith asked the question. Look at it here. It's in your comments. When we don't understand God, is it okay to disobey? If we, we, <coughs> we say don't understand, Brother Keith, but we're oftentimes, I think, just absolutely disagreeing with God. We, I mean, we would never want to be so bold to stand up and say, God, you're not right. You're wrong, but that's, don't we kind of do that by our actions? Sister Ann says you got to take it all or nothing because it's it's either complete obedience or it's not obedience at all. Incomplete obedience is not obedience. You guys remember the story of Saul, King Saul, who said, yeah, I went and I done the will of the Lord. I did all this stuff. Incomplete obedience. He did not kill the king. He did not uh, make sure the people left all the stuff there. He brought back animals and stuff. And, and Samuel was sent by God to tell him, oh, you disobeyed. He goes, oh, we, we did what God said. You can't be partially obedient and think you're being obedient. I don't, there must be something with us because I didn't intend to go this direction. 
Yeah, it's the same thing with the government. We may not agree. You're right. But, uh, you know, we, we, we yield ourselves. We give ourselves. Uh, we should obey, as we talked about this past weekend, obey God rather than man whenever, you know, they clash. But um, when they clash with our, just our will, when the government clashes with our will, doesn't give us the right to raise up against it. Now, if they go against God, it's a whole different thing. We need to follow what God said to do, okay? But if it's just clashing against our will, which is what I think has happened with the corona shutdown thing, a lot of times people go like, I ain't shut down. Oh, come on. You, we still get to preach. We still get to assemble. We still get to meet and teach. That's what it's all about, and we're going to get back to it, um, as, uh, to actually the physical assembly uh, very soon. All right, let me catch up on a couple of these comments where I can move on. Right. <laughs> Problem is, most times we do understand, just don't want to do it. I, 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 believe that all, I believe that's every time, brother. I really do. Uh, you and I have been together a lot of years, and let's just be honest with one another. Um, I, I got to tell you that my sin, um, I believe, is willful sin. I think I know. When it, when it comes to my heart and my mind to be tempted, I think I know right then and there, I feel the, the unction of the Holy Spirit that tries to stop me before I ever commit, and I push right on through, and then I act like I didn't know that I made some kind of a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. I chose to sin. I want to act like I didn't, but that's what I do. Um, amen. Uh, let's see. Uh, Miss Ellen says, follow God in his word, right by him, even with something you don't. Miss Ellen, you're exactly right. And I, I know that you've experienced a lot in your life. That's our whole purpose of this morning's message. Uh, we got some more we got to get back to in the text. But uh, guys, I'm telling you, that's why he does the correction. Uh, Brother Keith said that the husband's wrong. He'll answer to God. That's what you were talking about, Brother Wade. Brother Wade was talking about the accountability of the one that is in responsibility, which I think Brother Keith also mentioned. So um, you guys are spot on. Thank you all for tolerating that little tirade we went out on there. Um, but it's so responsible, it's so much applicable, I should say, as Jesus is coming and saying, look, you guys done, have done so many wonderful things. And I think too many times we estimate the church to be a good church if they're involved in doing a lot of good works. Notice the works thing. In verse 19, he said, I know your works, your charity, your service, your faith, your patience, your works to be at the end better than the first. So they got a lot of work going on. There's a lot of love. There's a lot of ch charity is what love is. There's a lot of service and there's a lot of faith. You guys are patient. You're doing a lot of community um, in uh, activities and and uh, you're showing a lot of wonderful blessings about how things uh, you, the church ministers uh, to the uh, to the world. You're good at showing good works, but if you think that that makes you right with God, you've missed it. If you're good, be, if you're good at even giving your tithes, if you give plenty of money, you give plenty of time. You get plenty of effort. You're you're contributing your own physical um, labor to the ministry of church, or um, you got love where you're feeding the poor, clothing the naked, on and on and on. And all of those things is what you're basing your spiritual walk in. Uh, then you've missed it because Jesus says, "I know you got works. I know you got love. I know you got service and faith and patience." And then you've even added on more works. You're doing more now than you've ever done. But I've got some things against you. And the things he's got, he says, you have suffered for that woman Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess and you let her teach. That's number one. You let her teach. She shouldn't be teaching. Secondly, what she's teaching. She's teaching that you seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Modern English, what, what this verse is saying to us in this day, that you've allowed her to say it's okay for you to participate in the things of this world and still call yourself a Christian. 
You can still be a Christian and you can engage yourself with the things of this world. You can join yourself with the false teaching. It doesn't matter what you teach as long as you just love one another. As long as we love one another, that's all that matters. Love is everything. And we love one another and we accept one another. Da, 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 da. And there's no teaching against sin. There's no standing firm against the, the processes of somebody needing to live a life that's committed and dedicated to the Lord. And so we just accept everything and everyone as if everything is okay. And so the church, excuse me, had allowed Jeze this woman that is referenced as Jezebel uh, not only to teach, but the content of her teaching was that it was okay for them to join in to the fornication, both spiritual fornication and physical, actual literal fornication, sexual sins, which was so prevalent in the Dark Ages in the, um, in, in the world religions. See, the world religions had, had come up and said, yeah, we all believe in God. We're all children of God. We're all one body. I mean, we're all of the same uh, human race. We are, all of our fathers, Adam, you know, and Adam and Eve's our parents. We're all the same, and God loves everybody. And all of those concepts that, yeah, Jesus is Lord, and we all worship and serve this. There's one heaven, and God's the same. It don't matter what you call him. You can call him Allah. You can call him God. You can call whatever you want to call him, Jehovah, all of these things. And it's all, we're talking about all the same one. And so here in the Dark Ages, there was this, this um, infusion. Um, uh, it it, it become an in, uh, a penetration of the world into the church. And the church accepts that. Because the church is thinking that by... Uh, bringing these people in, we're reaching them. Just let me say something to you very carefully. Listen to me one more time. We're in this coronavirus thing, right? And we got some folks we call frontliners or first responders. These are the people that are treating the disease when people test positive or, or they're the ones that's out there running the test on them and they're seeing them, they're being exposed to it on a daily basis watch these first responders. Every single one of them know they have to have their PPE, their personal protective equipment on. They have to have that. Why? Because even though they are exposed to the people, they're not to be contaminated by the people. Are you with me? Their battle is against the disease. They've got to be in contact with the people in order to be able to treat that disease, to discover it and treat it but they also must make sure that they care for themselves that they don't become compromised by the disease. The church, we got to reach the sinner, so we have to be in this world. But be careful that we don't become part of this world because we bring them in and allow ourselves to just say, well, we, you know, as long as you come to church or as long as you love the Lord, it's okay for you to have sex together. It's okay for you to, um, uh, to cheat or to uh, curse or to get drunk or to get high. It's okay for you to have the bad attitudes or, or have the wrong doctrine. In our church, it, it, would, it would be... Oh, counterproductive for me to say, yeah, I love you and it's okay for you to carry whatever version of scripture you want to carry. Because I don't believe they're Bibles. I believe there's only one. So that's why I tell you. And I know that sometimes people judge us as being maybe cultish because of, of the idea that we believe that we not only put our faith in Jesus Christ, but we live our lives to reflect that faith. Let me ask you, what good is it to say you believe something if you don't practice it? You know what I'm saying? I believe in Weight Watchers, but, <coughs> okay? You better watch it. It don't do me no good at all. It don't do me a bit of good at all to believe in Weight Watchers. You must practice your faith. You must make application of it if it's going to change you. Woo! <clears throat> I love the comments, guys. Y'all are spot on right there. 
We're in the world, but not of the world. You're exactly right. And a girl, you guys are right on. Let me tell you about um, this uh, seducing servants to commit fornication. Uh, my understanding is during the Dark Ages, um, let me see if I can find it in my notes. In the, do, 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 do. Yeah, uh, in my notes. It says, but Jesus had two things against the church. First, they allowed Jezebel, the self-proclaimed prophetess, to seduce and convince the membership to accept pagan gods, that's spiritual fornication, and many of the temples in that day had both male and female prostitutes, and deviant sex was part of the worship. We're talking about physical fornication, that they would go in and part of their spiritual supposed worship was the idea that they could take a prostitute and lie with her, and that brought them greater spiritual awareness somehow. And secondly, uh, this Jezebel had convinced them all to bring a meat offered to their pagan gods, and, um, and, to, and in this day there were trade guilds, uh, guilds is G-U-I-L-D-S, trade guilds or groups, and in order to be prosperous and get ahead um, in Thyatira, a business owner also had to belong to a guild. These guilds were associated with pagan gods. It was common for them to have a common meal in the temple. They would gather together, um, and you know, it's a, a, quite honestly a lot like the Masonic Lodge or things of the day, a lot of times these people think that you can't get ahead if you don't join the group, if you don't go to the particular social club that all the other businessmen attend, and you don't do the same things and go with them, sit down and have their drinks and their, you know, their jokes and enter, be entertained by their entertainment with the women that they may bring in or the men, uh, that type of stuff. This same thing was going around. It's not new. It was going on way back here uh, between A.D. 600 and A.D. 1500. And they, they would bring their, their meat. They would consume all the meat that had been offered to other deities, to all the false gods. And, and Jezebel was teaching that eating this meat that was offered to a false god, and, and she would say it was good to do that, and thereby worshiping that god was okay. It's okay to take part in their ceremony because you have your religion and he has his religion and she has her religion and we're all just worshiping the same God in our own little way, right? So it's okay. It's not okay. There's one way. It's through God's holy word. God gave us the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And God's word is synonymous with Jesus Christ. There's only one way. So you can't accept all the doctrines and be right. And listen to me. I, I'm almost a little reluctant because I know that some pastor's acquaintances of mine might see this and get offended. But I'm just going to tell you. Guys, if you let any and every teaching come into your congregation, you need to stop that. That's what was going on with Thyatira. The church had gotten to where they were just opening up and everything goes. As long as we show love to one another and we have service and faith and patience and, and we do a lot of good works, then we're, we're being the church. But that's not true. The primary purpose of the church is for us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ and his life, death, burial, and resurrection. It ain't about all the social work that's done. The social work's good. I'm not condemning that. But you can't use that to replace the primary objective or mandate that was given to the church, and that is go out and make disciples teach people that the reason that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross was because you're a sinner and you need to be born again through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You need to trust that sacrifice for the payment for your sin so that you can have everlasting life. 
That's the absolute truth. And and folks are opening up their doors to allow anybody and anything come in and do whatever they want to do. Brothers, these things ought not be. Jesus comes to the church at Thyatira with this letter and he says, I know your works and your charity and da 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 but I've got a few things against you and here it is. You let this woman stand up and teach. You not only let her stand up and teach in your congregation, I didn't give her the call. I didn't give her the anointing to be the leader of the church. I called you, brother, to be the pastor. I called you to be responsible for doctrine. I anointed you to be the one to lead people in the right spiritual walk. You stand up, you give that authority to somebody else. You let somebody else take that directive and you let them go with that. That's not what he gave you to do. So first of all, you let her teach. Second of all, you don't govern what she does teach. She not only doesn't teach truth, she's now teaching a, a heresy. That's the only word I can give it. She's teaching a heretical doctrine She's trying to blend the world into the church. And don't think that that only happened with the church at Thyatira. We're seeing that so much today. The church is trying to be appeasing to this world. We want the world to love our church. We, it, it thrills us when somebody comes in and says, oh, your church is so loving. And it does make me feel good that we're loving. But if we're only loving and we're not teaching the truth that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, then we have missed our calling. And I ain't much of a pastor. I'm just a, 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 a fake blowhard. And I need to be kicked out. You need to get somebody. All over, all over this place, we have to resist the temptation to try to please the people and remember that we've been called to please the Lord. Keith just put that on there. Man, you must be reading my mind. I know that there's a little delay in what you guys are getting and I said that about the time he posted that. Wow. Thank you, brother. Man. <laughs> Good deal. So, um, here, Jezebel was saying, it's okay for you to commit fornication, to submit to worldly living coming into your life. Um, that's why Brother Buddy tries to teach you. Um, guys, it's not okay for you to act like the world. You shouldn't dress. Let me go ahead. Let's go to it. <laughs> you shouldn't dress like the world. You shouldn't talk like the world. You shouldn't drink the same thing the world drinks. You shouldn't eat the same thing the world eats. You shouldn't go to the same places the world goes. I mean, just because they do it doesn't, you don't involve yourself. You don't act like the world acts. You, you don't follow the same thing the world follows. It's very, very imperative for you to understand that uh, we have one we follow. We follow Jesus Christ. And it doesn't mean that we don't get to enjoy things that are in this world. Right? But, go ahead. Let me, Come on, jump in. Okay, all right. He can't if, have, if, if you have a heart for those things, mm -hmm. then that's the indicator for you. You know what I'm saying? Where is your heart? If your heart is to follow the things of the world, then if you see that in yourself, it's not about the rule. It, that is an indicator that your relationship with the Savior is off. That's how so many people get it so bent out of shape. Oh, I've got to follow this rule. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to do that. And they're never going to be successful if they can't restore the relationship through that repentance and humility and go back to the Savior and restore the relationship. All they keep doing, though, instead of restoring the relationship, is trying to slop the rules in. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Now, now listen, what's wrong with being a friend of the world? You know, you would think that we need to be friendly 
and we need to be cordial to the people. What's wrong with friendship? Brother Wade just pointed out. It's about where your heart is. You're, 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 who you're serving, why are you bending and yielding to the things of this world? And it's because you have an, if, you, if, if it's because you have a heartfelt desire to have these things involved in your life, you're satisfying and pleasing and worshiping your own lust, your own desires. And God is not on the throne of your life. That's the problem. It, there's things that you can do, but these things are, are not ever to have the authority or the position of influence of who you are in your life. Uh, you might love, I love to go fishing. You know, my family loves to go fishing, but the, you, if you, you could take something as simple as fishing or hunting or sports activity or anything like that, it's just so simple things, um, having dinners together, you can have those things to become the priority because in there you feel like that that's where, how you identify your walk with God. Can, let me go here because this is going to be it's going to be an issue for the Baptist Church and especially Landy Road Baptist Church. If our if our eating fellowships become the primary focus, we if we just <laughs> What about that way? If we get to the place where we think that, you know, gospel things can't exist without refreshments. Uh, homecoming can't be homecoming unless you have a big meal. And all the focus is on the, on the meal and the fellowship. Mm -hmm. And we go like, look how great a church we are. Mm -hmm. Then we have missed it because we are substituting uh, the worship of the desires to please our flesh uh, in, instead of the, the primary um, mandate of preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus so Christ. If they show up for Friday night gospel singing only to bear with and sit through the sing yeah. just to get to the food, are you saying they're out of we got a problem. They don't. They're not. The God is not sitting on the throne. Well, they show up this Sunday morning just to hear the singing, right? And bear with the the service, right? And I've always had an issue, and I, I know that I've said it to, to the congregation before. You guys have heard this. Uh, some people, they'll call and say, who's preaching? Or who's singing at the gospel scene? And I, I, my response sometimes has been, and it wants to be all the time, what difference does it make? What difference does it make? What, is it, what does it matter to you who's going to be preaching that day or that evening what difference does it make to you who's doing the singing? If you're coming for the right purpose, you won't care because you're coming to worship the Lord. You're coming to be taught the word, uh, whichever one we're talking about. And so you're not there to be entertained. So you're not going to say, well, I don't like the way they sing. It doesn't entertain me, so I'm not going to come. Come on. Man, you, if you're there to worship God, if a donkey gets up there and brays, you can worship God. Amen. If, if, uh, if you're coming to worship God and get taught the word of God, it's amazing what you'll learn from a young child that will speak the word of God if you'll pay attention that God is speaking through that child. You can learn from a man of God out of walk. Absolutely. Out of the walk. That's right. And the Lord can still preach to you. So um, so we're talking about it's really, really important that we don't lose so much focus that we think we're just trying to get them in and we're being a successful church because we have um, a, a good attendance and people are, are coming and they're able to enjoy our church. They like our church. I'll be honest with you. Of course, everybody wants to be liked. But that's not the important thing. It doesn't matter whether you like me, like me as a pastor or a person. It doesn't matter whether you like our church um, and the way it's set up or not, the way we do services. And um, what really matters is: uh, Are you hearing the word of God? Are you receiving the message that God is sending you? The letter that He wrote to Thyatira. Are you receiving the letter that He's wrote to you? through the messenger that he has appointed and anointed. Whoo, y'all wearing me out. This is good stuff today. <laughs> Wonderful.
Um, so I, I just wanted you to be aware. So verse number 20, uh, we, we worked through that. We talked about how she started teaching. Uh, it's okay to commit fornication, to live worldly. It's okay to uh, get involved in other religions. That's eating things sacrificed unto idols. It's okay to indulge. You know, there's some big church movements that are, have advocated that we should work closely with Islam because we're all brothers, you know. That's ludicrous. It's crazy that, that we, uh, that the Baptist and the Catholic Church ought to be, you know, in hand in hand. And Buddhism and Hindu too. Buddhism and Hinduism, that's exactly right. New Age, uh, New Age movement. Now, uh, all of these things are to come together and that because, you know, you, you got to understand that everybody's just trying to find God in their own way. I heard that. Uh, Rick Warren, as a matter of fact, I heard him say. Uh, one They're time, all the just, same God. Yeah, all the same God. And you're just finding them in your own way. I just got to tell you that that is highly, highly dangerous. That's the same thing that Jesus is accusing this church at Thyatira of letting Jezebel teach. When it, she, when it says that she said you could eat things sacrificed to idols, she's actually saying that yes, yes, you're right. You're right, Pastor. The King James is the right one, and you're teaching the right way. But they're also right. Wait a minute. If they're different, both of them can't be right because there is only one way. Brother Wade? No, I was just going to say they end up, every one of them usually ends up worshiping their self. Mm -hmm. They end up preaching to Buddha, Hindu, that at some point you're going to attain unto and be God yourself. You end up worshiping yourself. <laughs> TJ said it's important to get them in, but more important than to know God. You're right, brother. We bring them in so that we can teach them. We do. Um, we sing a invitation song called "Just As I Am," without one plea, but that Thy blood was shed for me. So we come to God just like we are. But I'm telling you, it's not okay to stay just as you are. Brother Keith said, if your heart's focused toward God, you can worship in an empty room. I mean, just you and him, right? Empty pickup truck. Pickup truck. That's my place right there in the cab of the truck. Exactly right. And oh, how many times has God come in and some of my most high spiritual moments have been just me and God uh, right by myself? Um, I give you, I don't know if I, yeah, I guess I can. I was going to say, I don't know if I should tell you this secret or not. I think I've actually said it before, though. One of my favorite places is in the shower. I can't, I don't know what it is. God talks to me in the shower. And, uh, but uh, I get in there and, I, of course, I love to take a long, hot shower. My wife will tell you, I steam up the whole room. She hates it. And, uh, but I, uh, I love a good hot shower. And, oh, my Lord, he speaks to me about some things. And I have to get out. And when I dry off, I got to go find a way to, uh, to write it down. Uh, Miss Liz says that her back porch is where she likes it. And I think a lot of us have a place that we, um, that we need to find that is that worship spot for us, Miss Liz. And I appreciate you adding that in. So Jezebel says it's okay to enjoy worldly lust. And the second thing, it's okay also to entertain the idea of um, accepting other religious faiths or, or doctrines. Doesn't matter what you believe as long as as long as you believe, right? That's not true. Verse 21, this is what Jesus says about her. He says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Notice, he it goes on, but I want to I want to talk about this real quickly, verses 21 and 22. He says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. I think it's important to remember, I think last week uh, we talked about how that God required that the church themselves confront the situation of the false doctrine. And so Jesus is saying, look, I have convicted her and she still hasn't changed. Maybe the church didn't take a stance, but Jesus himself has spoken to her. She knows she's not doing right. Can I just, let me side note right here for yeah. a second. Um, there's a whole big difference, guys, between someone that's teaching a false doctrine and somebody that's just maybe teaching ignorance. Yeah. 
you teach something that's not maybe correct, but you're doing it out of ignorance. And somebody that is doing something that they know mm -hmm. is contrary to God's word for their own personal gain or their, um, it doesn't have to be a financial gain, but their, their own um, exaltation. And they, you, you, you will not accept what God believes or what God gives us as our doctrine. You'll twist it in order for it to fit what you want to accomplish what you want. There's a difference between that and just saying something out of ignorance. So please be aware that all of us, I'm the biggest dummy out there, and I have said so many things in sermons or in teachings that I'd have to go back later and say, oh, guys, I told you wrong about that. That wasn't right. I've studied more. I found it, and God has given me because um, you know, especially as a young leader or even a young convert, sometimes uh, we let our ego get in the way, and we think we got to know everything about everything. And if we're not careful, we'll we'll talk as though we know, and we really don't know. And we have, almost a hundred percent of the time, when I've done that, I found out I was wrong. So I'd have to go back and uh, correct that. And, but, uh, but there's a difference between ignorance and being a heretic, a teacher of false doctrine, a false prophet. So uh, just be aware of that. And so uh, Jesus said, she knows I gave her space to repent and she would not repent. That's huge to me. That's huge. Do you know that the Bible says if we have an issue with a brother, we're supposed to go to them and try, and if they won't, they won't be converted, then we take another brother with us and we go and meet with them and try to tell them their lost way. And if they won't be converted, then we bring them before the church and we try to get them to correct the falseness of their way. And, and if they won't change, then that we just separate from them. We choose to, some people call it excommunication, but the idea of, Shun them away. That's exactly right. We separate ourselves from them so that they may be ashamed, so that they may feel shame, and that so that the entire church may know that this is a false doctrine. This is a, a wrong way. Don't involve yourself with this person or what they're teaching. What they're teaching because their teaching's wrong, and that person because they are stubborn in their teaching and will not repent. And this is what happened to this Jezebel. He says, I told her, I convicted her, gave her space to repent, and she repented not. I know a lot of people that whenever you try to give them corrective instruction, they will hear what you say, but they're not listening because they ain't going to change. They're not going to get it. So it's very, very important that we need to be pliable in the hand of God. That when God brings us something from his word and says, hey, what you're doing is not right, what you're saying is not right, you need to change, you need to research it, you need to repent of your way, and then if you still fail to do that, if you refuse to repent, you're walking the walk of a heretic, and you're close to being excommunicated or uh, expelled or removed from the fellowship and made an example so that folks will know not only your teachings wrong and false, but you have a spirit of rebellion and you need to be removed from the congregation. All right? Then next, says uh, in verse 23, he, he said I was going to throw her into a bed and um, in verse 22, I'm sorry, 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they, re except they repent of their deeds. Now, he's not necessarily talking about physical adultery. He's talking about straying from God and giving their worship down the path that she is advocating. So if, if she's saying you can worship like this and you join into that, that bed we're talking about is a bed of death. It's a bed of wrong, false doctrine. And he said, I'll cast her into that bed. And those that, are, uh, that climb into that, on that wagon with her or get into that bed with her, he says, I, I will... Um, 
I'll have them in there. They'll, they'll come into great tribulation unless or except they repent. Now, the thing I love about Jesus is he's always got this ultimate ulterior motive. The, the ulterior motive of Jesus Christ is always to bring you and I to repentance. If I could remind you of verse the number uh, where am I at? What say? I'm going the wrong direction. Uh, verse number 20. In verse number 20 it says where Jesus said notwithstanding I have a few things against you. Uh, this his is not condemnation is correction and the purpose of his correction he has a purpose is to bring about repentance now we find down in uh, this verse verse number 22 he says if you follow after her teachings I'm going to once again try to bring you to repentance brother and sister let me tell you God's not trying to destroy you He has every right to destroy you if he wanted to. He's trying to save you. He's trying to convert you. He's trying to bring you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants to do. And even when you stumble, and you may even go so far as to join false teaching, it's possible you can join false teaching. He gives room for repentance. I love this about Jesus. He's always seeking to reach out and draw us back to himself. That's his purpose. I'm so grateful he doesn't throw the clay away just because it develops a crack. He brings it back and puts it on the wheel and he will work you and he will mold you to the vessel that he wants you to be if you will yield to him. All right, let me see if we can get to somewhere where we can stop. I'm not going to finish this whole thing today. I don't think for Thyatira, for I just don't think I'm going to get to it. He says in verse 23, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which search, searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, uh, this verse is, is talking about the idea that there's going to be offspring of this woman, Jezebel. If you allow, pastors, if you allow this type of false doctrine and teaching and rebellious spirited people to continue in authority in your church and in your teachings, you need to know this. They're going to spawn offspring. There is going to be some collateral damage that is done by that. So you'll not, if, if you'll address it now, if you'll address it urgently and early, you might be able to just handle that one thing. But if you don't, if you don't address it early and thoroughly, it's going to have... It's going to lay eggs. Let's just say that. It's going to lay eggs, and there's going to be infestation everywhere. It's going to have feeder roots that run out through the entire church, and, and there's going to be some good people that are going to be corrupted because you, pastor, didn't do your job. You didn't stand for what is right. You didn't do the tough thing. You'd rather be liked than to be right with God and you chose to either keep silence or maybe even to promote this individual and you knew in your heart by conviction of the Holy Spirit that what they were teaching and the way they were leading and their spirit was wrong. Wake up. Repent. Christ is calling you back to repentance. I'm not saying that you haven't been chosen to be the pastor. I'm not saying that you're not an anointed man of God. I'm saying that even a pastor, a chosen pastor, and an anointed man of God can go the wrong way. You can mess up. You can lose your way. 
you can stumble along the way. The good news is Christ calls you to repentance. He wants you to call out to him and acknowledge that where you have been going is wrong. What you've been allowing is wrong. And you haven't taken the proper stand or responsibility for what God's called you to do. And you now are willing to repent of that, acknowledge that he's right, you're wrong, and you want to turn around and do those first works over. He's calling to your repentance. So every church, every church member that may be watching, if things are not right in your life, if there's things that are going on in the church that's not right, people are have wrong attitudes or in position of leadership and leading wrong, pray that your pastor will hear from God and will repent and stand up and lead as God has called him to. I'll pray for him. I'm going to stop right here. It's almost 11 o'clock. I've got some things i got to do for the uh, concrete comes. I'm helping these guys here. Um, thank you for joining me today. We stopped at verse number 24. 23 was our last one. We'll pick up at verse 24 next week, okay, as we uh, finish talking about Thyatira. Um, if you will, uh, make sure that you look at these scriptures before next Tuesday. Verses 24 on through, I believe, 28, 29. Um, a couple things I just want to point out to you. Um, during this dark ages, the rise of the Roman Catholic Church really began to take hold over the lives of people. And part of the, the heretical teachings of that church, I'm going to be addressing uh, next week. Um, I'm not just anti-Catholic, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I want to be talking about some of the doctrines that they teach and why that uh, therefore the, the Catholic Church is going to be equated to this Jezebel because of their false teaching and their unwillingness to repent of their falseness. And I'm going to show that to you next week. So um, read up, study up as best you can, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. It's going to be a lot of Catholicism uh, next week as we come back together, all right? God bless you guys, and thank you. Uh, we're looking tomorrow night at 7 o'clock is our midweek prayer service. Uh, be praying for us. We're praying for our leadership um, as we uh, are... Uh, when I say our leadership, our government leaders, as uh, I'm, I'm looking every day to see them to get closer and closer to the opening up uh, of Florida, and I believe that's going to take place in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we are making plans right now for that. One of the reasons that we're maybe shooting for the day of the 17th of being our opening day is because uh, quite honestly, it's, um, it's after Mother's Day and, and we'll be able to manage the, uh, the large number of people better, but I'm not sure. It may be sooner than that, maybe later than that, but that's what we're shooting for. Pray with us that we can um, make good decisions. Also, um, however long that we are still out of personal meeting and in-person meeting, um, we're looking at and there may be a way that we can see one another before then um, maybe we do a, a drive up church one Sunday just before we get back together if that's possible uh, I'll be talking with Brother Wade about that and how that'll work as far as the streaming goes at the same time so that may put a little difficulty in his work but um, hey he's been uh, in our ministry for a long time he's used to me making <laughs> things tough on him so um, that won't be nothing new. I love you guys. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let everybody know how good God's been in your life. Stay in touch with one another. Minister to one another in the name of Jesus. Until then, bye-bye.